unreserved, unrestrained. Your love is wild. Your love is wild for me. It isn't shy. It's unashamed. Your love is proud to be seen. Uncontrolled, uncontained, your love is a fire burning bright for me. It's not a spark, it's not just a flame. All right, everyone, let's all stand to our feet. You're a lively group tonight, and it's good to see you. Uh, we're super excited to have Jason Upton. Are you excited tonight? <laughs> super pumped. And so let me pray and uh, let's just welcome the Holy Spirit into the room and uh, just believe that God's going to have his way and do what he desires to do. That's kind of the, the theme of the event, right? Is just come, Lord Jesus, come, have your way. So Holy Spirit, just welcome into the room. We thank you that uh, you have brought one of your uh, incredibly anointed and just um, just a, a, an incredible worshiper and an incredible worship leader, um, songwriter who has just touched the nations in such a profound way with his music. And um, we're just here to encounter your presence along with him. So we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us and you would guide us um, on a journey tonight to just encounter your presence in a profound way. We thank you for it. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Jason, Thanks. let's do it. Did, did everybody get their brownie that these guys made? These are like handmade. Did you guys know this? They got to get these brownies. Who wants this brownie? I heard, I heard that these amazing people made, took time and made brownies. And then they wrapped them like that. They look like they're pro. And I said, man, we got to tell people about these brownies. It's amazing. So, I want to start tonight this way. My um, youngest daughter, my third child, Rachel and I have four children. She, um, when she was really little, she always called my name in the middle of the night. And I loved it. And uh, my wife, Rachel, loved it too, of course, you know. And so she would call my name and my wife would kick me out of the bed, you know. And one night she called my name and I went down to go see what was going on. And she was, she was scared about something. And I said, you know, I, I didn't think that it was that scary, but it was really scary to her. And so I prayed with her and I, we invited Jesus to just sort of like be there with us and I got her to go back to sleep and I went back just about asleep and I hear her call my name again. So I go back again 
I did this a few times where I would say to her that she didn't have to be afraid. And she would agree. And then she would try to go back to sleep. And then just a few minutes later, she'd call my name out again. So the third time, it's three in the morning. So a lot of it was just trying to get back to sleep myself. But I walked into the room and I just said, move over, Lucy. And so she moved over and um, I crawled in with her. And I put my arm out like this and she snuggled into me within just a few seconds. She was fast asleep. And now I was stuck. <laughs> right? And so I'm, I don't want to wake her. So I'm just looking up at the ceiling. And, and, and it was as if the Lord just had me right where the Lord wanted me. And just said, hey, Jason, you see, words alone don't comfort us. Presence comforts. And so I just sat there. That's why we're here. That's why we live our days learning how to worship, right? And we don't learn, we don't worship here so we can go back home and not stay awake for the experience with the Lord. We learn here how to worship on the streets where we live, in the home where we live, right?
Every story is being told by you. We're all children on the journey. Yeah, we are. Jesus, only you can lead us through. Let our hearts be away, be away. Let our hearts be away, be away. Let our Surprise us, Lord. 
I was raised. I was raised in a time where we always talked about Jesus coming back. And uh, there was even a guy that wrote a book in 1987 called 87 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1987. Or maybe it was 88, I can't remember. But for whatever reason, he, he was a mathematician and brilliant, and so everybody talked about it all night. And all December especially, because it hadn't happened yet, you know, that year. And it just kept me up, you know. And then I, and then we, it never happened. And then the darndest thing happened, he found, he realized that he had made a mistake, a mathematical error. <laughs> and so then he wrote another New York Times bestseller called 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in oh, 88, whatever it was, 87, 88, 88, 89. Anyway. Oh, Lord. But it wasn't until years later I heard somebody say, We don't have to be afraid about missing Jesus' final coming. Nobody's going to miss Jesus' final coming. What we should be training our eyes in is to not miss his next coming. I was up in Minnesota with these amazing people, the fire starters, they call themselves up there in Minnesota, and they took us out bow hunting for carp. I went with my son Samuel, who's 22 now, he was little then, and uh, this guy gets out in the water and he's going to send all the carp out to us and I'm just trying to hold that bow back you know it's and I'm holding it back and I'm on one end of the boat and Sam's on the other and he goes all right they're coming they're coming and all the boys in the boat these boys that have grown up doing this they all see all these carp and I just I just let the arrow go I just let it go and it went first shot went right through this carp and I reeled it in it was just an accident <laughs> they were like that's amazing I never saw a carp the entire day but those boys they saw every one and I realized it's because their whole lives they've trained their eyes to see them We're a different breed. We have a different dialect, you know? Uh, we see the world in a different way, through a different lens. Not only should we not be ashamed of that, we should go after it. Start to see Jesus in your neighbor and then just start to tell that neighbor what you see. awake enough that Jesus could walk beside you on the road and you you'd recognize him God I want to recognize you don't break the bread pour the wine let our hearts come alive in your presence in your presence
Is a holy thing to be wild and free, like a raging storm on the calm sea. Heal my heart till my heart believes. It's a holy thing to be wild.
to be wild and free Cause our God is wild Our God is full of mystery Our God is freedom Our God is full of destiny His love has borders that our hearts will never reach His own Wild and free, cause our God is wild. Our God is full of mystery. Our God is freedom. Our God is full of destiny. His love has borders that our heart will never reach. His own. To be wild and free It's only thing To be wild and free Come on everybody So come on everybody Oh and come on everyone Run like a river Run like a river Follow the sun Hearts that are open with hearts that are open Just as wide as the sea It's the only thing To be wild and free It's the only thing To be wild and free Sometimes we come up on a mountain and uh, we can do everything to muster enough faith to move that mountain and the mountain still won't move. And after a while we realize that maybe the mountain wasn't put there by God for us to move it. Maybe it was put there for us to learn how to climb it. And then after a while of following Jesus and taking his hand, maybe we usually realize, whoo, it takes a lot more faith to learn how to climb a mountain than it does to just move it. Maybe that's why Jesus said it just takes a little faith to move. way which is it's the way of worship it's the way of prayer it's never a highway which is a good thing because what we just said if you're following in the Jesus way by its very nature it keeps us awake it's when we get on those highways right we kind of check out that we end up falling asleep. The Jesus way is always a footpath. And when Jesus wants to get us from one mountain to, an, to another mountain, I love bridges, but bridges are man-made. You know, when Jesus wanted to get us from one mountain to the next mountain, he made valleys, right? So he says, come on, take my hand, Jason. Let me lead you to where all the life is, right? I'm climbing a mountain. My faith could not move. 
is the only way forward is the only way through no bridges or highways directions or plans his pathways of prison
Yeah.
To be fully human, I love what Eugene Peterson says about this. He says, to be fully human is to have our, our hands in the soil and our heart and our minds in the sphere of God all at the same time. And um, Wendell Berry is one of my favorites. He's got so much to say about farming and all sorts of things but he uh there's this little book called conversations with wendell berry and i love reading it i i it's one of these books i always seem to have with me because even though i've read a lot of it i just get something new out of it every time i read it and um he was asked the question he, he he's in his 90s now and he, he's never wanted to convert or you know transition over to a a computer and so somebody asks him the question hey uh, Mr. Barry couldn't you write more if you transitioned from the typewriter to a computer and you could write more and we'd really love to hear more from you you know and this is how he answers this question which this has me right away when I hear somebody answer a question like that with this when you have a farm it doesn't really make any difference how wound up you are. So the question is, would you ever consider getting a computer? 
and kind of getting rid of the old typewriter? And his answer is, you know, when you have a farm, it really doesn't make a difference how wound up you are. That's a great way to start. If you're gonna, if you're gonna grow corn, well, you're gonna have to slow down to the speed of corn. If you're an artist, well, then you have a certain capacity to work well, your own speed and endurance. I've never bought the argument made to me repeatedly that if I had a computer, I could write faster. I know beyond any doubt that I can write as well as I can write at a sustained rate of two or three pages a day. And if I wrote more than that, my work would be worse, not better. The refusal to speed up, to hitch yourself to these mechanisms that impose speed on you is simply a way of staying within real time. The time in which things grow, in which good work is done. Taking the adjective good off the process might speed things up, but if you aren't interested in working well, then why work? He says, I've been... I just imagine when I'm reading this, the person that asked the question. You know what I mean? This is amazing. We haven't even got, you know, hardly got to it. I've, I've been reading a fascinating book about wine. Adventures on the Wine Route by a California named uh, Kermit Lynch. He writes that specialists are now telling vintners how they can speed up the winemaking process with heat and chemicals. The point that Mr. Lynch makes is that one can speed up the winemaking process, but what one actually has as a result is not properly speaking wine. It's actually just a kind of expensive mouthwash. (laughs) Real wine, good wine, is something that comes about in its own time. If the vintner wants real wine, he or she will have to accept its rate of becoming. As years ago, I was reading his work on how we eradicated, you know, in the the early part of the 1900s, two-thirds of the United States population were farmers. They lived on the land that they farmed and they ate the produce from that land. In the 1950s, we didn't really want what Merton would call mercy gifts, unpredictable gifts, sunshine and rain. We, we didn't want to depend on sunshine and rain uh, for our food source. So they came up with machinery that could make our food. And Wendell was prophesying against this. And he was saying, no, don't do it, don't do it. So we made machinery that made our food. And by 1990, less than 2% of the nation's population were farmers. And less than 1% of that 2% lived on the land that they farmed and ate the produce from that land. Wendell prophesies, he says, in the future, people will realize that our need for certainty is poisoning us. And what we'll want is we'll want farmers again. But farmers cannot be raised in a two-week or two-month or two-year program. Farmers, like artists and preachers and poets and musicians, they have to be raised to the trade. Why? Because a farmer, a real farmer, cares about the product, but they care more about the soil than they care about the product. They're willing... They're willing to let go a year's product to save the soil. So that's where we find ourselves. There's a revolt going on. There's movements going on. But when I started reading that, I couldn't help but think of the church. I couldn't help but think of worship. I couldn't help but think of how dependent we've become on the machinery of it all. And sometimes it expediency, right? Right? Expediency, trying to speed things up. Maybe sometimes even trying to speed salvation up. This is the promise. The seed has gone into the ground and the garden is overtaking the world. That's the promise. 
The seed Jesus has already gone into the ground and the garden is overtaking. It's taking humanity a while to catch on. It's taking the church a while to catch on. Right? But that's the promise. It takes time. And uh, so I, I, I wrote a little song about this. It's called The Farmer in the Field. And people say, oh, that's not worship, Jason. And I say, nothing. I don't say anything. Wake me, Lord. Open my eyes to your beauty. Wake me, Lord. Open my heart to your grace. Wake me, Lord. Open my mind to your mercy. Merciful sunshine and merciful rain. When I seek you, I'm going to find you. You're the giver of all good. I'm gonna find you You're the giver of all good things The giver of all good things oh. Giver of all good things And Lord have mercy on the farmer in the field and Lord have mercy on the poor the weak the real Lord have mercy we have played the devil's game Lord have mercy like sunshine and rain when I see
I wrote this song. Can we sing one more song? You do. Yeah, just one song. Yeah. One song. Just as this is, I wrote this a couple weeks ago, and it just says, Your mercies are new every morning. Your mercy surprises me. My father, my future, my portion. Your presence is all that I need Every good gift comes from you The sun, moon, and rain, they come from you The breath of my praise comes from you
be seated. I just want to say, um, gosh, it was 2005 when I was at Christ for the Nations, and you came for the first time. And, uh, you know, you talk about an aged fine wine, and um, it's sweeter than ever. Just your heart exuded in music. It's just sweeter than ever. And it, it's very refreshing because I think probably, Jason, you would agree with this statement that not everybody lasts, mm. unfortunately. Mm. There are people that start, that have a purity, um, but they don't last. And uh, it's one of the staples of Unveiled Worship Conference um, from the very beginning, that we wanted to invite real fathers and people that have been proven over time that they know God's presence and they live in his presence. And that's true of you. And we're just honored. And uh, Jason is, um, you can sing as much as you want. Um, so... Um, I'm going to do my little thing and then I'll turn it back to you. You can sing some more or speak, whatever you'd like. Um, but I did want to uh, come to you today, uh, tonight, um, and one opportunity that we're going to give um, for you to sow into uh, this ministry. Now, how many know that you didn't have to pay anything to be a part this year? Uh, yeah? Um, I did that specifically because the Lord told me to, and uh, I just felt like he um, spoke to me, and he said, make it free, make it uh, just everyone is welcome. And, uh, but I also want to tell you a story, and uh, many of you know, and uh, several of you have ran across, uh, in fact, just one here just a few minutes ago, interested in our worship academy that we uh, hold each year. And I do a lot of teaching. Um, I often say that worship and praise and what happens in the portion of the service that we give honor to the Lord is probably the most misunderstood and uh, least taught on uh, aspects of our Christian faith. Uh, and so much is, you know, taught from the Bible around principles, but for some reason when it comes to worship, there's just not a ton of teaching on it. So it's very misunderstood. So I've made it my life's mission to teach and to train and to equip um, worshipers to know why they sing, to know why we lift our hands, to know um, what's, what's, it, let me ask you this question. What part of the service do you think God enjoys the most? 
I think he knows the book he wrote pretty well. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that he's well educated in, in, in the manuscript. Um, but he longs for, in fact, we dedicate half of the service typically to giving glory to him, and yet we, a lot of times we don't understand some of the things that we are doing, what the significance is of lifting of hands, of, of singing, of shouting. You don't want to know the, the most pathetic thing that you can ever do in church with your mouth is give God a half-hearted shout. Ah. Come on, have you, ever, have you ever heard it? Have you ever done it? Come on, give God a shout. Ah. Ah. No. Okay, okay, all right, all right. You got it, you got it. Maybe if we shouted more like that, we might have walls fall down. Maybe that's why there's no power is because it's half-hearted. If we worship God all the way, remember that David danced with all of his might? When's the last time you did anything with all of your might? I mean all of your might. We might get better results if we did it all the way. Um, so I do a lot of teaching on praise and a lot of teaching on worship. And uh, kind of the way that the Lord... But by the way, have you, ever, have you ever studied much on the life of David? How many of, how many of you read a lot about David? Anybody, anybody, you know, pretty well educated on his life? Yeah, I've, I've read every scripture. I've, I've studied his life. I've written books on his life. Um, and uh, I really believe that uh, if he sat down with a psychologist... It would be one of two things, bipolar or schizophrenic. Because you can't figure the guy out. He had this innate sense and relationship with the Lord that caused people to scratch their heads and say, what is this guy doing? I don't get you. Remember the time that his men overheard him and they... He just said, man, I wish I had a drink from the well of Bethlehem. And they're like, let's go get him a drink from the well. So they break through the enemy lines, risk their lives, come back, and they're like, guess what we got you, David? And they hand him the cup, and he pours it out. <laughs> Can you imagine their jaws at that moment? They're like, we got that for you to drink. And he's like, no, I can't, I can't receive this. I must give it as a drink offering to the Lord, and he pours it out. And he was doing stuff like that all the time, all the time. They couldn't figure out why he would do certain things. Remember when Saul wandered into the cave, and all of his men are in the cave with him, and they're like, Look at what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has... I mean, he handed Saul to him on a golden platter. I mean, he's, he disrobes himself. The guy's naked in the cave. I mean, he's, not, he's as vulnerable as it can get. And he's like, look what God has handed your enemy over. He goes up. He just cuts the, the tip of his, his robe off. And he goes back, he goes, I can't kill him, guys. And they're like, what do you mean you can't kill him? Of course you can. Here's a knife. Just go over there and stab the guy. And he's like, and he learned a very important lesson in that moment. Am I going to obey the opinions of all 400 of my men or obey the voice of the Lord? And he did things that people didn't understand. And so this one time, he sinned greatly. And this is the story that I want to tell. I was getting ready to have a, uh, a time of worship at my house. And I called just a group. There's, I don't know, 40 or 50 people that I invited. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to, to give communion. 
tonight. So I called up our head usher, his name was Bobby, and I said, hey, Bobby, I said, um, I really feel like we should do communion tonight. Um, can you bring, you know, some communion elements? And, and this was Bobby's response. He said, yeah, Pastor, hey, let me look out in the garage and see if there's anything left over from last time. And let me see if I can find some leftover communion elements, and I'll bring them tonight. And when Bobby said that, it was like I died inside. I was like, I mean, I remember exactly where I was. I was on El Camino Real in Encinitas, California, driving past Garcia's Mexican restaurant. I mean, and Bobby tells me that, and I pulled off into the, I was so shook that I pulled off into the parking lot, and I'm like, Bobby, I got to go. Don't worry about communion. I'll, I'll take care of it and hang up the phone. He's like, you uh, and, and I'm literally sitting there, and God is like, something is not right here. I said, God, what is it? Why do I feel like I just died inside? So I, I pulled back out on the, on the road, and I was passing by a Pier 1 Imports kind of home goods shop. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to go into the home goods store. And he said, I want you to buy everything you need for communion tonight. He said, I, I want you to spare no expense. So I went in, and this is what the Lord told me. He said, I don't want you to buy anything on sale. I want you to pay full price for everything you buy. So I bought this ornate um, platter. I bought a bunch of candles. I bought a goblet like a golden goblet. It wasn't real gold, but it was like 50 bucks. I mean, it, I mean, it was a really nice goblet. And then a, 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 a plate for the, the, the bread. And then right next door was a Ralph's supermarket. I went into Ralph's. I bought the most expensive bottle of wine they had and the most expensive piece of bread that I could find. And, and so I'm, I'm at Pier 1, and I, I give them all the stuff, and the, the lady looks at me and she goes, oh, hey, guess what? These candles are half off. <laughs> and I said, uh, ma'am, if you wouldn't mind, I'd really like to pay full price for... <laughs> she goes, what? <laughs> what did she just say? I said, I'd really like to pay full price. She goes, I don't even know how to ring these in. It's all barcodes, and like the whole store shut down. She's calling the manager over that I need you to report to the cashier. This guy is crazy and wants to pay full price for these candles. <laughs> There's people lining up behind me. They're watching and they're like, What are you doing? So they had to like adjust the computer. He had to reprogram some things to pay so I could pay full price for everything. Spent Two or like $250 on all this stuff. And finally, I'm checking out. And as I'm driving home, after I get the wine and I get the bread, the Lord reminds me of when David had sinned. And the, the, the death angel is sent out to, to basically kill people all over Jerusalem. And the, the, the death angel is standing at Jerusalem with a drawn sword, and David sees it. And, and he's at this certain field, and he goes to the field, and the Lord says, make a sacrifice right here. The man who owned the field comes running out and says, what are you doing here, king? And David said, I'm here to uh, offer a sacrifice so God will stop the plague. He's, and he said, do you have what I need? And and. And this is what the man says. I will give you all that you need for the sacrifice. I'll give you this field. I'll give you what you need to make the altar. I'll provide everything. You know what David's response was? I refuse to offer God a sacrifice that I didn't pay full price for. And I learned in that moment what true worship is. I learned that God is about costly worship. You're like, what is God looking for? 
We talk all the time in the academy. How do we get God's attention? How, how do we come to him on his terms? What is he longing for? Have you ever wondered this? God, what are you looking for in my worship? I can tell you what it is. Something costly. Something that costs you something. David said, I will not pay half price. I have to give you the full price for this sacrifice. And it was only after that that God stopped the play. So when I say that this conference is free, it's free. Everyone's welcome. But what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to give worship tonight and present an offering to the Lord that costs you something. It got real quiet when I said that. And here's the thing. For some of you, $50 is costly. I've been there. I've been there. When I literally didn't have hardly any money to give. But I always gave something. For some of you, if you gave $50, that wouldn't be costly. You're like, oh, I could, I could give that right now and never even feel it. All I'm asking you to do when it comes to giving in this offering for this conference to help us with our expenses is to give something costly. Something that hurts a little bit. Something that makes you just, man, this, 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 this is a little stretch maybe. And, and, and the bottom line is I'm asking you to, to ask the Lord. What does he want in your worship tonight? Is that cool? Everybody okay with that? I'm not telling you what to give. You don't have to give anything. God's going to take care of this conference. There's no doubt. He wouldn't ask me to do something if he wasn't going to help me pay for everything that needed to be paid for. But I am presenting to you a, a, an opportunity of worship and to give something costly to the Lord tonight. So can we just pray, and can you ask the Lord, if, can you pray with me, that the Lord would um, put a number, put something on your, on your heart that would cost you something, that would be costly before him, that would mean something um, in worship to him. So Father, I just lay this before this group of people. We're learning, we're growing, we're... We're asking you for more, God. Last night, we accepted a key to doors that you want to open, to doors that you want to close. We're believing for more. We're believing, God, that you are meeting us and you are changing us, that we are being taken from glory to glory in Christ Jesus. So whatever it is you're asking, I know what those numbers are that we need to, to even break even. You know those numbers. But God, even more than numbers and dollars and cents, we don't want just, we don't just want to meet a need. We want to offer costly worship to you tonight, to lay it at your feet, to present something, Lord, as an act of worship, to say, here's our offer. Here's what we want to give to you as an act of worship before our King, before our Lord. So whatever that is, would you lay it on the hearts of your people to give and to give willingly out of a generous heart? We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right. Well, the best way to give, um, if you want to uh, do it online, of course, you can write physical checks or whatever and drop them in the box out there. But we have a, uh, a code or not a code. What do you call that thing? QR code. So you can just scan that with your phone. It's also on your um, sheet on the back. There's a donation button. We just ask that you would uh, do that. Uh, before you leave conference to help us with our expenses. I'm going to invite Shannon Clark to come up. Man, Shannon, you were ahead of packed house 
at your breakout session. I heard it was awesome. So um, she's got a very special event, and I wanted to give her the opportunity to share just a little bit of the vision behind it. Um, I went to the first year, uh, the last year, I was in Africa, so I didn't get to go. But she's got to save the date, um, I think, was on your seat when you... Um, when you sat down, and, and, but I wanted to tell and take a few minutes and just share your vision. Um, I believe in it, and we want to endorse it and help you promote it. So here. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shannon Clark, and I started and founded an organization called The Standard. And how many of you guys have heard of The Standard? Okay, so there's there's a good handful. Okay, great. So for all of you guys who um, have never heard of the standard, uh, I was a youth pastor for a number of years and had kind of transitioned out of that role, thought I kind of was all done with youth ministry, kind of felt like I had graduated to adults. And, um, and the Lord has something different in mind for me. And, and I was driving after, um, I was driving in Highlands Ranch area right after the STEM high school shooting. And I was thinking and I was praying in my car and I was just asking the Lord, and many of you guys who were in my session actually already heard this story, so just bear with me. But I was in the car, and I was just thinking about my students who, um, who I used to disciple. And I was thinking about all of the narratives that were coming at them. And I was just praying to the Lord. And I was like, Lord, our kids are getting wiped out. They're getting sideswiped from every direction. They're getting hit with every narrative. And they're getting swept away by the spirit of the age. And I was like, Lord, you've got to raise up a new standard. Like, Lord, what are you going to do about this? And as I was praying this, I just had this picture in my mind. I had this vision, and, and I saw this rushing river of, like, just students getting swept away, and it was definitely down into a, a stream of destruction and kind of heading towards the, kind of the end of this destruction road. And, and as I was um, watching this, I saw that if somebody just took a stand and stood in, the, in this river, that it would act like a levee, and it would re-divert the river back to its original design and course. And so in that moment, I was sitting with the Lord, and I went, I don't know what you want to do about this. You just have my yes. And so it was a moment with the Lord. It was very serious. It wasn't like a, like the glory filled my car. I really wish the glory filled my car. It would have been a great confirmation. But I was sitting there, and I was like, Lord, you just have my yes. And so I started thinking to myself, like, Lord, what was it that kept me steady growing up? Like, I never had, like, a huge rebellious period. I've always loved the Lord. And I was like, Lord, what was it? And I was thinking, like, I had an incredible youth group that really kept me steady. But then there were these marking moments that I had with God throughout my whole teenage years. And there were these Holy Spirit moments where I had encounters with God that transformed my life. And I'm 33 years old now that I still look back on. How many of you guys have had moments like that when you were a teenager? Many of us have. So we know that this is important. And it's really easy to see in this day and age what all is wrong with Gen Z or what's all wrong with what our society is, is looking at. But really, God has an answer for this. He has an answer for this generation and he has a plan for this generation. And he is raising a standard within Gen Z. He is raising the standard in them. So what we're doing is, when I was praying into this thing, I was like, Lord, like, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to just take kids to Starbucks on the weekend? Like, what do you want me to do? And um, because I was okay with that, like, I was like, you just have my yes. It's this open-ended check, Lord, that you get to have, which is a scary thing, by the way. So beware when you give Jesus your yes. He'll, he'll lead you into amazing directions. But... So I was praying into this, and, and I was like, Lord, do you want me to start an event? Do you want me to start something? What do you want me to start? I'm looking for confirmation. And a few months later, I'm sitting in a coffee shop up at a, the YMCA of the Rockies. I'm sitting in their lobby, and this older gentleman sits across from me, and he goes, what is it that you're working on? Because I had my Bible flipped open, and I was like, oh, I'm just preparing a message for a youth camp that I'm going to be speaking at. And he goes, yeah, that's great, except for the Holy Spirit told me I'm supposed to help you. What are you working on? wow. And I was like, uh, okay. And then I just spent the next hour just unloading on this random guy who I'd never met saying, I believe that God is raising a standard in this generation. And I believe that he is calling Gen Z back to its original identity. I believe that God has a plan for this generation that will lead to 
global harvest. I believe that God is raising students to carry the gospel with fire and passion into their high schools and in the college campuses, to set the world on fire so that it's not that the, we're hearing sh the stories about shootings, but we hear stories about Asbury. We start to hear more stories like that in our high schools, in our colleges, in our elementary schools. Can we imagine to see harvest go out like these little fires? And I believe that that's what, we, that's what we're called to do. That's what we're doing. We're raising just a generation and creating space for students to be able to come in to a space like this, like Unveiled, to come into a facilita facilitated environment where God gets to have center stage. He gets to identify and deal with the depression issues and anxiety issues and suicidal thoughts. He gets to deal with those principalities. And we believe that we wanna raise the identity back into Gen Z. And we believe that what God is doing is not just a gener like Gen Z youth movement, but God is actually raising a Malachi movement where it's the father's hearts to the sons and the sons' hearts to the fathers, which means everybody in this room is signed up for that. That means all of us get that. And so we're doing an event and we're doing an event in October and we've got a few months out. And so I just wanna invite you, one, to pray. Pray for us because we are going into battle. We're going after giants in the land and we believe that God already has an answer and he's already given us territory. And we've seen literally tens and twenties of students in our, in our sessions come to the Lord. We've seen students get radically healed. We've seen students get radically delivered of suicidal thoughts and get totally set free. It's been powerful. We've seen students' ears open up, completely deaf. It was opened up, 90% deaf opened up. We've seen crazy things where it's setting these students on fire. And so I wanna invite your students, your grandkids, your, your neighbor's kids, this is a perfect environment for them to get involved and actually get encountered by the presence of God, equipped in their truth, in truth and identity, and then also empowered with the fire of God to go back into where they're called to in their high schools, in their middle schools, in their football teams, and all of that. Does that make sense? So you guys have this. Um, I'm just going to ask you guys, take this home, throw it on your fridge, and pray for us. And then invite your friends, invite your, your kids and your grandkids and your nieces and uncles, uh, nieces, not that one, nieces and nephews, <laughs> that one. And um, invite them to come because we believe that God is going to move in this generation and we're going to create space for God to have center stage to do that. So thank you very much. And uh, Shannon. So um, God spoke to me as, as you were talking, and we want to give a tithe off of any uh, donations we get through this conference to this event. So we, we just want to sow into, so whatever's given, we want to uh, take 10% off the top, just pour into your event. So um, let's, yeah, yeah. So we believe in what you're doing. I'm going to turn it back to Jason, and uh, man, take your liberty, and uh, just whatever God's leading. So, blessings. Return, return, oh, my soul, to your rest, to your home. Return, return, oh, my soul, never fall.
transform me through the darkness, the chaos and the pain. You transform me through the wilderness when I can't find my way. Running from the very part of me, asking me to stay. You welcome me home to where I. And the pain, and you transform me through the wilderness when I can't find my way. Running from the very part of me, asking me to stay, you will come me home to where I belong. You will. Return, return, oh my soul, to your rest, to your rest, to your home. Return, return, oh my soul, never fall. Alfred. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 5. Thanks, Brian. Matt, is this mic going to be okay in front of the... Okay. It's so great being with you guys. When I think of rising, one of the first things that comes to my mind today is moonflowers. I'll tell you why. Uh... My friend, Abby Gamboa, she just released a new record today. And uh, if you listen to that record sometime tonight, you'll hear this song, Moonflowers. She had asked me and the Upper Room guys to come down and visit their writer team last fall. And I had just been in England um, at David's Tent and... While there, I was in the garden room at the main house there, the Whiston Estate there, and my friend Pip from South Africa, she's sort of the curator of that garden space. And uh, the first night we were there, my buddy Benjamin Forehand and I, he plays guitar with me often, he and I went down and we were just standing in this garden room and while we were standing in this garden room, I said, do you smell that? And he said, yeah, I'm overwhelmed by it. It was the most amazing smell. I've never smelled anything like it. It overwhelmed us. But it over, you know, sometimes when you smell an artificial overwhelming smell, you want it to stop. But this one, it was like you couldn't get enough of it. So I started inviting all my friends you got to come smell this. This is amazing. So we all went. Then I was playing tennis the next morning with my friend Cassie Campbell. And we were getting up at 6 to beat the, you know, every, you know get, get to it and start the day fresh and then get over to worship. And, 
And I said, before we head to play tennis, Cassie, you got to smell this. So I brought her over to the room, and uh, the garden room, and, and I, I, we walk in there. And immediately when I walked in there, I said, wait, I can't smell it. So I went to Pip. I said, what's the deal with that? She said, oh, yeah, those are the moonflowers, she said in her South African accent. She said, yeah, the, the darkness, it makes the fragrance come alive. So you can't smell them during the day. And so I came to the writers group and, and, I, and I said, oh, we've got to write a song about this, guys. Moonflowers. I mean, this is too good, you know. And uh, so the very end of that song, it says, I heard there was a garden somewhere south of London where moonflowers are hanging overhead. And although they're lovely, in the light, the gardener said, come back tonight. The darkness makes the fragrance rise. I just thought, man, how many songs, right? The enlightened, in the enlightenment stole darkness from us. So the church took on that philosophy that God can only be found in the light. But when we read scripture, we find the opposite. God's hardly found in the light. God's mostly found in caves, in darkness, at night, in dreams. We took that on. We took that philosophy on. And it stole something from us. And I'm thinking, wow, what kind of songs, right? If we just let ourselves let that fragrance rise, what kind of fragrance rises from the songs written when the darkness falls. When I think of rising, I think of surrender. There's this famous poet, Iranian poet, mystic. His name is Hafiz. Has anybody ever heard of him? Probably not. 1300s. But somebody gave me a book of his because they know I'm into poetry, which we're a rare breed. And so what I like to do is I like to read his poetry and then, and then I like to sort of write it in prose just to make it simple. So in one of his poems, he says... He's trying to make a distinguish, distinguish between a saint and the rest of us. So he said, he says, so the difference between the saints and the rest of us is this. He likens it to a chess match with God. He says, eventually, God just makes this staggering move. He says, and the saints among us, the saints among us realize what God has just done. This unbelievable move. The saints among us realize what God has done. And with laughter and great joy, they just cry out, I surrender. The rest of us, we still think we've got a thousand good moves. What a great one. When I think of rising, I think of uh, the poem, 30 More Years, I read recently by Wendell Berry. He says, when I was a young man, grown up at last, so he's like in his 20s, right? When I was a young man, grown up at last, how large I seemed to myself. I was a tree. Tall already. And what I had not yet reached, I would yet grow to reach. And now 30 more years added on. So I'm 49, so I'm turning 50 here this year. 30 more years added on. I've reached much I did not expect in a direction unexpected. 
I'm growing downward. Smaller. One among the grasses. When I think of rising, I think of falling. All four of my children consecutively learned to walk faster than the one prior to. It took Samuel forever. Then Emma, almost forever. Then Lucy, a little bit faster. And then Oliver, super fast. And we realized that there was nothing wrong with any of them. They could have walked just fine. The problem was with us. We were terrified to let him fall. And the further we went along, you know, we just... You know, for the first one, you're like, <gasps> you hit every bump going home from the hospital and you're like, is Samuel still alive? <laughs> Stop the car, pull over. <laughs> right. And by Oliver, we were just like, good luck, buddy. <laughs> right. I was thinking today about the Wright brothers. I mean, what if the fear, when you watch the videos of them learning, like what if the fear of falling kept them from learning how to fly? Years ago, I wrote a song called Redwoods and Daisies, and the end of it I say, elders are people who hold law and grace in their hands. They hold tension. Where death is a doorway and falling is learning to stand and less is more than we really need and empty empties a space for us to receive I remember hearing Merton speak on that in Raids on the Unspeakable he said Whenever God creates space, the Holy Spirit hovers over that space to create something new. Oh, if we could just get that. But what we try to do is we, the moment God starts to create space, we start to fill in the space. Instead of trusting, God intends to hover over that space and make something we've never experienced before. When I think of rising, I think of David and Goliath. Literally, I learned this reading. I don't know if you've ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath. Anybody read it? I love that book. And, and, and in it, he basically says that, that we often misread the scene the same way that the army of Israel did. That the great size of Goliath makes us all assume that David didn't have a prayer. That his weaponry, right? His sword, his javelin, his muscles, his spear, right? Too much for David. But actually, it was Goliath who actually didn't have a prayer. Because Goliath's tools of combat, weapons, were mid-range combat. David's sling was long-range. It was going to go through the air. A skilled slinger could take down an opponent armed with swords and spears and javelins without ever coming within reach of his enemy's weapons. And what more, <laughs> David believed God himself would guide the stone. David, David would simply show up 
for the battle and sling the stone and the Lord would drive it to its mark. It's a question worth asking. What weapons are we bring into the fight? This is an important question because Yaroslav Pelikan, the great writer on the creeds, he says this about the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was came out of the church, the Nicaea, 50-some years prior to Constantine adopting it as language. And what he says about that is, he says, my father used to always tell me, the difference between a dialect and a language is a language has an army. Why is that important? The difference between a dialect and a language is a language has an army. We're so often afraid of having our own dialect. I grew up in that. It's like we can't have our own dialect. People have to understand what we mean. Death is a doorway. Falling is learning to stand. Less is more than we really need. Empty is a space for us to receive. This is dialect that the world doesn't understand. Constantine is not going to want to hear that. Keep filling the space. Keep getting more and more and more. Keep being a part of the machinery of it all. What weapons are we bringing to the fight? Are we listening to the lie that we have to go with the conventional? If they come with these kind of weapons, then we should go back with that kind of weapon. This is the weapon of our warfare, that we trust the Lord. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Jesus saw the crowds, chapter 5 of Matthew. And he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. And his disciples came to him. And he began to teach them. Saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'll never forget going on a silent retreat with Father Larry Gillick, who happens to be blind. And being on my first retreat with him, I just thought, Lord, it'd be so good if he could see. And I was kind of praying into that the first day. Lord, it'd be so good if Father Larry could see. <laughs> and then I realized after the second day, I wrote in my journal, oh, Father Larry could see. <laughs> he can see. I'm blind. The moment you realize that you're blind, right? That's when you begin to see. The moment you realize that you're deaf, that's when you begin to hear. The moment you realize you're poor, no matter how much money you have. The moment you realize you're poor, that's when you begin to experience the riches of God's kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What a promise, huh? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. How many feel the need for peacemakers? In our world today. I was in Holland a few weeks ago. And I kept hearing this. Peacemakers. Peacemakers. And as I began to think about it. I started to realize that. So much of our world. Is based on leverage. Especially the West. Everything's leveraged. Even our relationships with one another. Leveraged. We don't even know how really to relate without leverage. We don't even know if. Sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. It's just so ingrained in us. Philippians 2. One of the oldest worship songs, hymns that we have. Of the church. Jesus was equal with God. But he never used it as a leveraging tool. He lowered himself. That's real rising, isn't it? He lowers himself. Beneath not just his disciples, but beneath the lowliest of the lowly. That he would be raised up again in resurrection. Peacemakers, the reason that we don't have a lot of peace in our world, even though we have a lot of religion in our world, we have a lot of so-called spiritual people in our world. We have lots of negotiators, great negotiators. Even the peace talks are called negotiations now, right? Peacemaking is not deal-making. Peace is a gift That only comes, it's a divine gift that only comes through prayer. Deal makers negotiate. Peacemakers, we pray. And in prayer, we receive the divine gift of of peace. Peace is only coming to our world as a divine gift. Peace is only coming. And and how does that start? It starts in the local. It starts in your marriage. It starts in your home. It starts in your family. It starts in your church. How is the church going to bring peace to the world? Everybody's talking about the church taking over government. Oh, man, we've got 50,000 denominations. Why? Why? I'm not against all that. I just think we should probably get our house in order. Peace has not come to even the church because we are deal makers. We're leveragers. We've taken on the system of the world in hope for peace. Peacemakers pray because we know peace only comes being in the presence of the one who can give it. And this is the problem. 
peace is often not a good deal for the one who prays. It's not something you would often even want to negotiate. It's coming as a gift. And this is the thing, like every gift, you can either receive what is being given or you can set it aside. So I was thinking about that and I I met at the last night of worship, there was this elder who I just loved and I wanted to have him over and to the place we were staying at and I'll keep his name out of it, but it, it was so beautiful. We're, we're chatting and he, he brings up to me his story. Now he doesn't know I had shared this with some of my friends that Al was with me and my buddy Lambert there. But he wanted to talk to me after the worship night. And he's an elder in the church. And they were going through a big, big, big thing that happened in the church. And um, can somebody bring me some water? It, I need to come here three days prior before I minister because it's like, it's so dry here. My God. Um, Thanks, guys. But he was so moved, and in one of the services, I was, wor- I was leading worship. And, you know, oh, thanks so much. Oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> this is great. I live here. That's amazing. I'm going to open it for you. No, no, don't open it. Oh, yeah. Okay, don't open this one. Oh, thanks so much. All right. Oh, this is beautiful. Shapers. All right, I can talk for like 10 minutes. But he's, he's chatting with me, and he says, I thought he was going to show me something else. And <laughs> <laughs> oh. So he's, talk, he's talking with me, and he says, um, This thing is awesome. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, my bud, Elder. It's very odd that you have an... Uh, it's very normal to go into prayer rooms and have women. We went into this prayer room and it was filled with men. In Holland, Dutch men. And women, but it was like tons of men and they were going for it and then we got out to the worship and they were like this guy is an elder in the church and he's just weeping and just so in and so I just wanted to chat with this guy I said tell me your testimony he said well years ago I I did really well in business and in my early part of my life like late 30s I sold my I had several houses in Amsterdam, which are expensive. I had businesses and I sold them all and made millions of dollars. And then in the midst of all of that, I realized that my wife had been cheating on me with many, many men. And he's telling this story and I'm, he's telling it through the car phone of my friend Lambert. And Lambert doesn't cry a lot. And all of a sudden, Lambert starts shaking as he's telling his story. And I feel this sense of not only urgency and importance for me to really tune in, 
but also how real this is to Lambert, his lifetime friend. And he says, and, and, and he says, and, and Jason, in the midst of this, so when you were singing last night, you mentioned the psalm, Psalm 27, which was actually the psalm that my, my biological mother wrote over my life when she gave me up for adoption. And I read in a letter from her 30 years later when I opened up my adoption papers. One thing I ask of the Lord, that I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. All the, she, she prayed over me. One thing I ask of the Lord, that you'll dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life, that you'll be a worshiper. And I'm reading this when I'm 30, after I had done all sorts of worship. She had been listening to my worship music for years because she had named me Stephen, not Jason. And it would, she would feel like maybe Stephen was dead. And then this prayer team said, you should listen to this music that we have in our prayer room. And they burned her a copy, a Jason Upton copy of a CD. And then, you know. She would listen to it whenever that oppression would come over her that God hadn't answered her prayers for Stephen. She'd listen to the Jason Upton record. So I had just shared Psalm 27 and said, what house are we going to live in? Are we going to live in the house of fear? Or are we going to live in the house of love, the house of God? And, and, and we got to make a decision. And he starts Weeping, And he said, because that was the psalm that the Lord gave me when I went to prayer on what I should do when my wife, you know, had affairs and wanted a divorce and didn't want to be married to me anymore. And the Lord said, don't negotiate. This isn't a deal. Give it all. And he... This guy next to me, Lambert, he's weeping. This guy's crying on the phone. And he said, and I, I sat with the Lord. And, I, and he said, Jason, it, this was, I knew how to make a deal. But the Lord said, don't make a deal. Give it all. And he had this son, young at the time, named Samuel. And somebody had given him one of my early records that I sing a song over my son. Samuel, will you lend me your ear? This is the voice that your father hears. If I speak the word and no one has the vision, can I count on you, my sweet child, to listen? Samuel, let me hear you. And he would listen to that over and over and over and over and over. Well, the Lord just told him, give it all. He never negotiated he never made a deal. He gave it all and went home a pauper to live with his mother. Now I'm seeing him and he's married to Miriam and has three amazing children. And the elder son, Samuel. Everybody's coming over to Lambert's house the next day. Because I'm going to sing Samuel over their whole family. God resurrected his entire life. Resurrected his family. Kept his relationship with Samuel. And Samuel loves the Lord. The Lord said to him, just give it all away. And he did. No deal making. Just total trust. I just sat there mesmerized. We think victory is having the same strength as Goliath, coming back with the same power, right? We think victory is knowing how to negotiate, how to make deals. That's what politicians do. We're the people. We're the children of God. The Bible doesn't say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be great politicians. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will receive the gifts of God that can only be given by God. The reason there isn't peace is because the church is using the same manipulative things that the world uses.
it is a really important question to ask. What weapons are we bringing to the fight? But my peace I leave to you. I love one of the translations that says, my own peace. Why I like that is because Jesus is saying, I fought for this peace. I prayed for this peace. This peace was given to me. I'm, I, my own peace I give to you. Hey, when the world forgets you, I've not forgotten you. I'm giving you my peace. I will be there for you in the midst of the storm. I'll be there for you when you trust and you don't deal make. I'll be there for you. You can trust in the sunshine and the rain to come. The mercy gift, the unpredictable. You don't have to take the machine. The safest mask of Satan is to use the name of God to back up all of our false peace. The name of God is actually being used in our day for demonic action. Oh, and you'll fundraise off of your demonic action in the name of God. Because you just, all you have to do is get your side. You fundraise the same way the other side fundraises. It's, it's definitely not about sitting in prayer and waiting on the Lord to blow our minds with what he's going to tell us or ask us to do. It's not getting his heart on the matter because his heart on the matter, matter will often feel like, what? The way it will be with me and the Lord most of the time is the way it actually is within the Gospels with the Lord and the disciples. That's how it would be if we were all, most of the time in church, if we were listening to Jesus in prayer, we'd be like, what? This is why I say, whisper, whisper, whisper in my ear. Tell me words I thought I'd never hear. There's, there's two sides to that. The one side is like, tell me that I'm a child of God. Tell me that I'm loved by you. Tell me, tell me, tell me, right? The other, the other thing is, tell me words I thought I'd never hear. Words that blow my mind. Words that make me wait on you. Don't, not, not rend the heavens and come down, take away my, my need for faith by giving me certitude. But train me. Train me, Lord. I'm kind of nervous saying this because, but I, I think it, it just hear me out, okay? Th this is not a statement. It's just important to say that sometimes the safest mask of Satan is to use the name of God to back up our false peace, the name of God is often used for demonic actions. Do you know what President Truman said after we exploded the atomic bomb over Hiroshima? He said it, I quote this. We thank God that it, the bomb, has come to us. And we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes. The false peace. Oh, you can get it. We can even win. 
But real peace, it only comes as a gift from God. It's interesting that one of the first questions that is asked by Jesus in the Gospels, John 1, I love it. One of the first questions is, teacher, where do you live? And why that's powerful to me is because you know, following Jesus requires that we change places in a way. It's that we learn to live in God's house. And to live in God's house, we need to learn a completely different dialect, a completely different way of thinking. There's even a new language. <laughs> new dialect, actually, think is better. <laughs> You're home to me, Jesus. I wrote, you are where we all have come from. You are where we long to go. We have journeyed far from Eden, and we are coming home. So let our eyes be filled with wonder and let our lives be filled with song and let the way of Jesus lead us back where we belong. You are home to me, Jesus. Can you just give me a, just a few more minutes? I, I, <clears throat> this is... One of those, sometimes you have messages that are like a song. You know, you tell a few stories, you have a couple lines. This is heavy. Even prayer, if we, we need to become a people of prayer to bring peace, because peace is only given as a divine gift. But it's important even within prayer, which when you listen to my music, I've never ever told anybody to lead worship like I lead worship. Ever. Never. You'll never see me on YouTube telling people ever because I've never done it. I, that's not the goal to brand your style of worship <laughs> and then make everybody be a homogenous copy of what you do. The goal of worship is not the expression. The goal of worship is the activity. If, if everything we sang on a Sunday morning, we actually lived, if just the church alone, everything we sang on a Sunday, we lived actively, the world would be changed instantaneously. If just Christians did it around the world, But the great thing about prayer and learning to pray is, is actually prayer itself. This is Thomas Merton. He says this, if you want a life of prayer, the way to get it is actually by praying. <laughs> he says, we, we've been indoctrinated. So, he said this in the 50s. We've been indoctrinated so much in the means and ends that we don't realize that there is a different dimension in the life of prayer. In technology, which we have a whole lot of that in the church, in technology you have this horizontal progress where you, you must start at one point and then move to another and then another. But that's not the way, the way you build a life of prayer. In prayer, we discover what we already have. You start where you are, and then you deepen what you already have. Why is that important? Because prayer isn't prayer, worship, following Jesus. In our systems of the world, and right, what we've been trained in, it's always upward. 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 To rise is to go upward. <laughs> to rise is often to first go downward. It doesn't mean we're not rising. 
But the reason people don't want to go from glory to glory is because it's a lot of downwards. And the downwards are scary. And you have to let go in order to ascend. With Jesus, with the American system, right, which we have a lot of syncretism with capitalism and everything, right? And I get it. I get it. But when I go to Brazil and minister, there's a lot of syncretism with, you got Catholicism and like voodoo and, and we see that. Oh, we see it real quick. And we speak to it. We're a little nervous about speaking to our own syncretism. I've just noticed that we are. I'm not nervous about having that revelation that I have that in me. I'm not preaching this just to you. It's a message to me. And when I preach, it's preaching to me. Because I know that you're indoctrinated by the same thing I've been indoctrinated by. And it's this system of a... We're all Christians, right? And everything our nation does is Christian. It's not Christian. We are, we are an alternative society within a society. There's a lot of things we... I love our nation. I think it's the greatest nation to live in. When I come back from places, I love being in America. I love it. I love, I love bridges. I don't want to have to every time go down into a valley and come up the other side for every single drive of my life. I love bridges, but God doesn't do it the way we do it. And then we're all confused and bummed out. And it, No, it's just Jesus doesn't care about what we make all the time. Oh, oh, that's right. You guys do bridges. That's right. Well, but what about the sides? You're not even going to get the sides of the mountain if you don't. Well, okay. Why do I say that? Because with Jesus, it's never about further and upward. With us, it's always the next number. And it's always, if your golf game is a certain number, then it's got to be that next number. It's never good enough. With Jesus, it's not about the number or higher or did they really like it, Jay, or did they not? Or did you feel it? Did you feel it? Woo, did you feel it? No, it's always about deeper. Just come on, Jason, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Let's come up. Maybe we should come up to the surface because people don't really like poetry, Lord. Jay, you should write parables. Somebody asked me the other day, so what are you writing next? I said, well, I've got 17 or 18 songs that I haven't even recorded yet. And they got a lot of poetry in them. And so, but, man, I feel like the next thing for me is, man, there's not a lot of parables in worship. And I thought, wow, that'd be fun. Jesus is always about, let's go deeper. Prayer is just prayer itself. Remember Jesus in Gethsemane. Matthew 26 I have pulled up here. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. I was telling these guys about this today. I, for a long time, I've had this revelation that of the, the wind and the waves. It's just hard for me to get over that. I, I just love this. There's this dog just chilling. <laughs> this, is a, I've never, this is an experience I've never had. And I've just... His name is Jesus.
That's amazing. <laughs> Uh. Oh, Samuel's in the second row. <sighs> I like you. Uh. Let me, let me start by saying this, and I'll tell you the story about. Sometimes our job in prayer, Jesus says, sit here while I go over there and pray. How, how often do we do that when we come into the house of God? Learning, like, I just want to challenge this, because you guys are obviously radical worshipers, or you wouldn't be at the Unveiled Worship Conference. So I'm, I'm like, how, how can we press it even further? Right? It's like, we can grow. We don't have to homogenize worship. Make it all the same. Every single Sunday, we sing the same thing over and over again. We could just do different things. Don't blame Jesus for holding us back. Right? But what about like, Coming into the house of God on a Sunday. And, and what if we could hear the voice of the Lord say, Okay, Jason, sit over here. Sit here. Now, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to stay awake. <laughs> while I go over here and pray. Sometimes... Our job in prayer is actually not to pray, but rather be with Jesus, watchfully waiting while Jesus prays. Years ago, I was in a, I had this revelation I was reading the story of the wind and the waves where Jesus is on a boat sleeping and the disciples are terrified. And I remember thinking, I've seen this before. It took me a few weeks and then I remembered, oh, it's Gethsemane. It's the inversion of that same story. The wind and the waves, eternal wind and waves is happening and Jesus is now up. Wrestling, afraid, and the disciples can't stay up for it. The Lord spoke to me and said, Jay, I want you to learn to stay awake for what Jesus is awake for. And learn to sleep to what Jesus is asleep for. Jesus says, this is a much longer message than I wanted it to be, but I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And then I'm going to sing a song over you. Jesus says, I've come not only to give you peace, but to give you abundant life. And, and, I, and I was thinking about that today. That, you know, when I think of Rising, I was like, I think of abundant life. And the craziest thing is, it, it's not just Jesus is going to give you abundant, you know, like, it's not just my life. It's life itself. And I, I started thinking about that. I was like, man, isn't it crazy that Jesus is offering abundant life, yet Jesus is, the, this is so backwards, like everything we've been talking about that tonight. The one with no possessions is offering up abundant life.
Because life is actually, it does not require an abundance of material possessions. Life does not require an abundance of material possessions. Because life does not require material abundance. It only requires material sufficiency. Wendell Berry said that too. What amount of, this is the question, what amount of material possessions will it take to reach material sufficiency? I wrote down on the plane today. That's really the wrong question. It's actually the other way around. What amount of of possessions am I willing to relinquish in order to gain the life of abundance given, being given to me? So it's like, you get that? So it's like, when I think of rise, I think of abundance and the way to the abundance that Jesus is giving is actually relinquishing. I love this song by Rich Mullins. Anybody ever heard of him? I love this song. He said, oh, you, oh, you did not have a home. I mean, I, lo- I love the theology of this, actually, because it's so crazy. Oh, you did not have a home. You, there were places you visit frequently. You took off your shoes and you scratched your feet because you knew that the whole world belonged to the meek. No, you did not have a home. And I love this. And you did not take a wife. There were pretty maids all in a row who lined up to touch the hem of your robe, but you had no place to take them, so you did not take a wife. (laughs) Birds have nests and foxes have dens, but the hope of a whole world rests on the shoulders of a homeless man. You had the shoulders of a homeless man. Oh, you did not have a home. And you had no stones to throw. You came without an axe to grind. You did not tow the party line. No wonder sight came to the blind. You had no stones to throw. And you rode an ass's foe. They spread their coats and cut down palms for you and your donkey to walk upon. But the world won't find what it thinks it wants on the back of an ass's foal. So I guess you had to get sold. Because the world can't stand what it can't own. And it can't own you because you did not have a home. Sometimes the Lord speaks simple. Sometimes I don't even know. But what I do know <clears throat> is that we're not the only ones longing. God's longing for his sons and daughters. He's longing for his children. We're not the only ones, even through the text of scripture, who sometimes ask, hey, why are you sleeping? Sometimes we feel that God's sleeping. Sometimes all of heaven is like, why are you sleeping? You're the one sleeping. And there's this back and forth. But ultimately, you wouldn't be here tonight, and I'm not here tonight, and I don't, I haven't given my life to not long for God. You long for Him. I long for Him. But we need that intersection. I want to invite you into this. I'm going to sing a song over us, and the beginning of it 
I sing just like a normal song. Like, it's us to God. You know, like the norm. Like, hey God, I'm here. <laughs> Are you listening, you know? And, uh, but then it flips. And it's just a, a, a way, because sometimes it's easier to, to just do it in a song, you know? Sometimes just giving us an opportunity to hear God say it back to us. His feelings, His longing. So I wrote this, and I'm inviting you into it, and as I sing it, if, if, if you, if you want to come forward and just accept that invitation from the Lord, do so. If you want to just kneel down where you are. I don't, I'm not here to tell you what to do. But I'm just going to sing this and, and, and finish with it, sing it over you. It's called Longing for You. Father, Father, do you have a minute? I need to talk to you. I'm wondering if you're here with me. I'm so scared, it's hard to move. Are you sleeping? Can you hear me? Calling out, I'm crying out. Are you listening? I need you. Let me 
take this load off you Are you sleeping? Can you
Let me read Psalm 62 over all of you. Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. Amen. I shall not, I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. Would you stand with me? The weight on God in silence is to weave a rope. Is to weave a rope as we intertwine our will with God's will, as we wait on him to speak to us. If you're waiting on God for something right now that is pressing on your heart, would you extend your hand? If there's things in your heart that you're pressing in on, amen. Now, would you come up here? And I just want to bless what God's doing in your life. Come on up. <clears throat> the Lord, we come before you right now, each one with a weight, each one with a burden, each one with a cry of our heart. Father God, I ask right now in the silence of this moment that you would speak a good word. Speak a good word to each man, woman, and child up here right now. Speak a good word, a comforting word, a trusting word. So I'm going to go into silence again. And I want you to listen. Listen for something that the Holy Spirit needs you quiet enough to hear.
Now take that word and surrender it up in prayer or worship to the Lord in your own way. Just either verbally or quietly or secretly. Just surrender that word and say, God, do that. God, build that. 